and welcome to the Middle East Report. In this uh, program today, we'll be asking a very poignant question. Is there a future for Christianity in the Middle East? Uh, it's 10 years since the uh, war in Iraq in uh, 2003, in which we've seen a mass exodus of uh, Iraqi Christians, um, the, who are the indigenous people of Iraq. We've also seen big exodus of Christians throughout the Arab world. And so we'll be asking, is there a future for Christianity in the region. Also in this program, we'll be discussing the plight of uh, Iranian Christians who face incredible persecution under the Islamic uh, Republic of Iran. And yet despite this persecution, we're seeing a rise in the underground church as many Iranians are, are finding Christ. And to join me in today's program, I'm joined by Stuart Windsor, who's the special ambassador to uh, CSW. Hi, Simon. It's great Hi. to be with you again. It's good to have you on the Middle yeah. East Report, Stuart. And, and here before me, I've got your book, yes. uh, which is called God's Adventure. And I just want to quote, because the first paragraph of your book is excellent. It says, uh, National Director of Christian Solidarity Worldwide, Stuart Windsor is a larger than life in every respect, a combination of ex-RAF, ex-British intelligence and Assemblies of God pastor, a former Bernardo's boy, Stuart has been involved in extraordinary adventures as he sought out and helped many of the heroes of today's persecuted church. I just think it's fantastic. Um, so, Stuart, can you... No, I didn't write that. <laughs> <laughs> you could have done. Yeah. Um, but can you just uh, explain to our viewers um, very much uh, your life and your background and what you've been involved in? Because um, just, just looking at this book here, you've been on many adventures. Yes, I have. And... and Funny enough, when I go to churches sometimes, uh, the people say, where do you come from? And I let them guess. And most of them can't guess because, of course, I was in the Air Force for 20 years, but I'm a West Country man, who are. And um, so I was raised in the West Country at a place called Sherborne. It's a beautiful abbey. I was christened in that abbey. In fact, Wingfield Digby's uh, uncle, grandfather, I think, christened me in the abbey when I was in the, in the 40s. So... And then when I was 10, I'm the eldest of five, my mother left us and so my father couldn't look after us. And he and his brothers, my uncles decided, well, should we keep them together, all the five of us, or what should we do, or should we split them up? And they decided in the end we would go into Bernardo's. And so we went off to Plymouth to a reception home to get us used to living in a community and then up to Sussex to a place called Crowborough in East Sussex, where we were in a Bernardo home, mixed home, with uh, a part of a community of 50 children. That's where we were until I joined the Air Force as a boy entered in, at 16, off to Wolverhampton to train as a telegraphist. And then when I finished the training, I eventually found myself in May 62 in Northern Ireland on a, a, a camp, a radar camp. And there, for the first time, I met a real Christian whose life spoke to me. You know. We use this term in CSW sometimes. Um, preach the when it's St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel at all times and only if necessary, use words. And um, um, this lad, Russ Williams, a Welshman, really lived out the gospel. He was totally different to us. And so his life spoke to me. And so I questioned him about why he was different. And he said, well, I'm a Christian. I said, well, I've been christened you know, confirmed, and he said, but what does God's word say about you? And I was brought face to face with the reality of my sin and, uh, and the motives in my life and what was the purpose in life. And so just in a matter of weeks, I decided to devote my, and, uh, devote my life to the Lord Jesus, and I accepted the Lord Jesus as my personal saviour, and my life changed totally and dramatically. And so since May 62, I've been following the Lord Jesus, and eventually that path led me 20 years in the RAF, nine years working at Northwest Water Authority as a staff training development officer, called to the ministry up in Cheshire uh, at a, a place that's now called the Foundry Fellowship, um, a Pentecostal Church in Widnes in Cheshire, and then finally uh, being marooned on a mountain in southern Armenia with Baroness Cox and Sam Yegnazar from Elam, and we nearly died in that. Um, blizzard in minus 50 and meeting Baroness Cox, sorry, and then eventually in May um, 1993 being called into CSW in a miraculous way. And the calling's in the book. I didn't seek to join CSW. Uh, I didn't ask to join them, but the then chairman, Mervyn Thomas, who's now the CEO, called me and said, what are you doing? 
um, with your life. And I said, well, Mervyn, actually, I've met Lady Cox on a mountain I'm in. I think God wants me to work for CSW. And so I'd already met Mervyn. He'd been to our church and spoken. And so that was my first interface with CSW. And so uh, I was the national director for 20 years. And I've stood down out of part-time retirement. My wife doesn't think I'm part-time. And my friends don't think I'm part But I am actually working less. And uh, I'm the special ambassador now. Mm. Excellent. And you have a tremendous passion for the Persecute Absolutely. Church. Absolutely. It's what God's called uh, And CSW are doing incredible work in highlighting the plight mm. of uh, Christians facing persecution around the world. Um, Let's uh, let's focus on um, some of the news items. I mean, here I've got uh, you know, a copy of the Times here, and it says our churches will become museums, Iraq's exodus of fear. Yeah. And uh, really, since the war in Iraq in 2000 years, in which we are uh, approaching the anniversary of the war in Iraq, um, it's really the plight of Christians throughout mm. the Middle East who have suffered uh, terribly. Um, and we've seen a mass exodus of uh, Christians, not only leaving Iraq, but also other places in the Arab world. Why do you think this is the case? Well, I think the, the problem, first of all, um, you know, uh, the Middle East is the cradle and the birth of Christianity. So it's a contrast, really, contradiction. There has to be a future for Christians in the Middle East. And so we are called to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and, and Jerusalem. So it's important the church prays for Jerusalem and recognizes its importance to us. Um, and one of the problems is, of course, there has been increasing discrimination harassment, persecution, deaths in custody. And of course, Christians don't feel safe and secure there now. That's the issue, the big issue. Um, and the problem is that under Saddam Hussein, of course, they were well treated. And so it's, it's a bit of a contrast, really. But unfortunately, it's worse for them now. And the one thing we don't want is for Christians to leave their countries. And Christians are patriotic. They love their countries as well as loving the God who saved them and uh, who looks after them and loves them and, and wants them to remain in their country. So it's a big issue. I mean, I mean, just looking at the figures uh, quoted in the uh, Times article here, they, they reckon in Iraq alone, for example, prior to the war in Iraq in 2003, there was 1.4 million Christians living in Iraq. And now it's estimated there's only 400,000 left. Um, and if that trend continues across the Middle East in the next decade, surely we're going to see dwindling, dwindling Christian minorities like the, like the Jewish community were forced out of, of the Arab lands after the creation of the state of Israel. Could we actually see uh, the decline or the complete exodus of Christianity in the Arab world in the next decade? Well, we hope not. And Christians had great hope in the Arab Spring. And in Egypt and other countries, there was uh, a recognition that perhaps something is going to change. There's going to be more democracy, more freedom. But very unfortunately, we don't know yet where it's going to go. For instance, if we take Egypt... We've been told by Egyptian Christians uh, the Arab Spring hasn't really begun yet for us. And so we need to pray for these countries. We need to show solidarity with the Christians in these countries. And they are seeking God in huge prayer meetings in the Middle East. I mean, you know, there have been some fantastic united Christian prayer meetings in the Church of the Rock in Egypt where thousands of Christians Cops, evangelicals, charismatics have come together to pray and seek God. And there's been a great uh, showing of the Holy Spirit in these meetings, great uh, shows of uh, unity uh, and unity of purpose. So we need to pray because we, we don't believe that this has ended yet. And so uh, it's for us in the West to pray, show solidarity and do all we can to help them. And uh, we've got a clip to go to now. It's entitled Christians in the Middle East Struggle for Acceptance in the Muslim World. I think that at the moment there is a crisis in the Arab world because of the Arab Spring. The question is where the Arab Spring is going, nobody knows. But basically the Christian community of the Middle East is emptying out. Uh, and there is a great deal of apprehension because they don't know what the future brings. If you look under Islamic rule, you know, at first there is a period in which there is a thriving of the Christian community under Islamic rule because they work together establishing the Arab civilization. When the Crusades came, the majority of the people of the Middle East were Christian. When they left a hundred years later, they then become a minority. 
generally Christians stay aside and then they support whatever regime takes place. This is the history of the Christian church in the Middle East. It, it's the way it has survived. It doesn't take sides. But each side wants them to take a side. And so they get caught in the middle. And there aren't many in the Islamic groups that are saying, you know, you're full citizens with us. Uh, we will give you full privileges. So they're worried. In Iraq, we've had ethnic cleansing of Christians. You know, their churches have been bombed and the majority of the Iraqi Christians have emptied out of Iraq. My relatives who have relatives in Homs said that every church in Homs has been destroyed or desecrated and most of the Christian community has left. Uh, we know that in Egypt, during periods of stress, a lot of Christians have emigrated out of Egypt and some have converted to Islam because it's very convenient. If you become a Muslim, you have more privileges. Today in the Arab world, in Egypt, in Syria, and in Jordan, the Christians emphasize the most important thing is we are of the land. We are indigenous. We were here before you guys came. Together we have formed this society. We are not foreigners. We are not the product of missionary activity. And that is the message. Welcome back to the Middle East Report. And you can see in there uh, from that clip, the uh, very sad story of the uh, indigenous Christians uh, in the Middle East who are suffering uh, incredible persecution uh, today. Uh, Stuart, which really brings me on to the question, really one of the main reasons for the uh, persecution of uh, Christians really from Iraq and how it's all stemmed across from the mm -hmm. Arab world uh, has really got to do with Iraq in, uh, with the war in Iraq in mm -hmm. 2003. Um, and since then, we've really seen a kind of ethnic cleansing of mm -hmm. the Iraqi Christians. Um, do you blame some of our Western leaders uh, for their short-sightedness in seeing some of the problems that have developed since? Well... well it's a big issue, isn't it? And, and we have to thank God for people like Andrew White, who have actually saw the problem coming and went and is working there. And of course, one of the things is that many, many evangelical Christians and churches in the UK support Andrew, uh, uh, receive his um, updates and are busy sending funding in for him to help and feed the people uh, that he works amongst in Baghdad. So it's a difficult thing. I, I, I obviously, uh, when the war started, we hadn't really any clue as to what might happen to the church. But since we've seen this mass exodus and the treatment of Christians uh, in terms of uh, discrimination and harassment get worse. And so we probably, as the church, have lots of things that we have done wrong and we have not probably thought through our, the way we act and we've not been united in our treatment of the Christians uh, in the Middle East and so therefore we must take probably some blame. But I think lots and lots of churches are concerned, lots and lots of Christians are praying, lots and lots of Christians go to see for themselves and do what they can and of course we do uh, support the in indigenous church. We have links with the Anglican uh, bishop in the Middle East uh, who's reporting and looking after Christians in Egypt and Syria uh, and Iraq. So we get reports and uh, in terms of advocacy, we do what we can, but it's not been a particular uh, area of uh, uh, responsibility for us because we've had bigger problems elsewhere, but it is a big issue which we in the West have to confront and try and deal with. Mm. Uh, and uh, so many of the uh, Iraqi Christians, such as the uh, the Assyrians and the Chaldeans, um, escaped all the violence and the mayhem mm. in Iraq uh, during the sectarian conflict after the uh, war in Iraq, which really 
um, was triggered off in around mm -hmm. 2004, 2005, and found uh, sanctuary and safety in Syria under yes, the regime of, of uh, Bashar al-Assad. And yeah. uh, now we've had a, a bloody civil war going on mm. in Syria for the last two years in which the uh, Christians have been very much caught up Absolutely. In, in, in the mm. violence. What is the current plight of uh, Christians in Syria? And uh, more importantly, what can we do to try and help them in their hour of need? Well, it's very difficult in a war situation as to really know what's happening. But we know Christians are caught up in it, as you've said. They're suffering. Uh, many are fleeing, which is a problem because we don't want them to do that. But who, we can't blame them, can we, in a right. war situation? And so um, uh, it's, we've yet to see how that's going to play out in terms of what might happen. We see the West now uh, are certainly talking about aiding uh, the rebels. Um, there have been talk has been talk on the news this week of perhaps even going further than that. And so we have to wait and see how it's going to play out and what's going to happen before we really know. We can say for sure what's actually happened to the church. But Christians are caught up in it. They're suffering in it. And we need to pray for them. Uh, absolutely, which which is uh, incredibly important to actually pray, but also to recognise their, their their plight as well, because yeah. so many um, Syrian uh, Christians had um, uh, the regime protected them. Uh, there was you know freedom of worship in, in Syria, mm. uh, and now with a civil war almost at its heights, we could see the overthrow of uh, Bashar al-Assad. And if that happens, it looks likely the Muslim Brotherhood or mm -hmm. more extreme Salafist groups would mm -hmm. actually come to power and the plight of Christians then in Syria would be far worse than it is under his this uh, is the, barbaric regime. The big problem is, Simon, we don't know who these rebels are and within them they've been Ill infiltrated probably by al-Qaeda and by Sa Salafists, as you've said. And so the end of all this... We really don't know, but we need to pray. We know it's important to pray. Jesus said, my house shall be a house of prayer for the nations. And so when we pray in our churches, we must pray for countries in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Ab absolutely. Uh, and the other issue I want to discuss as well is the ancient uh, Christian community in Egypt, the mm -hmm. Coptic Christians. And um, uh, many of them have been very concerned about the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood since the fall of mm -hmm. uh, President uh, Mubarak back in uh, 2011. And uh, now we've seen the Muslim Brotherhood uh, candidate uh, come to power, President mm -hmm. Morsi, and great fear within the Christian community of um, increasing Islamicization mm -hmm. and attacks on the uh, Christian community. Community. Mm. What, what is the situation facing Coptic Christians Well, the right situation now? is this. We really don't know how the constitution is going to look. And basically what Christians wanted, when the Arab Spring started, there was great hope that the constitu constitution wouldn't be based on Sharia law. But what they wanted with moderate Muslims was a constitution based on the citizenship, that whether Muslims or Christians, they would be citizens of Egypt. It doesn't look as though that's playing out that way at the moment, but we know there have been protests in the square again. We know that many, many professional young people are not happy with the situation. They're not happy with the Muslim Brotherhood and the, and the drift towards uh, an Islamic state that's quite extreme. And so we need to pray for Egypt. We're showing solidarity with them. We're working with, very closely, we're working with uh, Bishop Angelus, who's the head of the Coptic Christ, uh, Church in Britain, uh, and we're praying for the country and we're doing the work we can to try and see a uh, situation better for Christians in Egypt. But we need to pray for them and we need to do all we can to help them. Absolutely. And uh, we've got a clip to go to now, uh, which is entitled Bearing the Cross uh, Christian Persecution in the Middle East. Reverend Majid al Shafi always wakes up to the same stark reminder. An Egyptian interrogator carved out this cross on his back. The Egyptian secret police tortured Majid for being a Christian activist in Egypt. The officer that tortured me, they don't call each other by names. They call each other by numbers. Officer number 27, he came, he said, you tell me the name of your friends, I said no. And he bring an Egyptian knife, it's called mangal, is what they use to cut the grass. And they make cut in the back of my left shoulder to the bones, and they put salt and lemon in the open wounds. Why were you arrested? Why did the Egyptian government torture you? We started a human rights organization in Egypt, underground human rights organization. 
we build churches inside caves, inside mountains, because according to the Egyptian law, you cannot build churches. You cannot even fix the old churches. Fearing for his life in Egypt, El Shafi managed to escape the country, and then he received religious asylum in Canada eight years ago. Majid now operates One Free World International, a human rights organization based out of Toronto. He's an evangelical Christian, but he tries to help Christians in need within the Middle East, regardless of denomination. An armed bodyguard accompanies El Shafi. There are fatwas, Muslim death threats, against him. Majid is on his way here in Toronto to check up on Rami Atia, an Egyptian still traumatized from being tortured. Rami and his wife Christine are Egyptians. They were full of optimism when they married. They had wealth, a thriving business, a future, and later children. But that vanished when Egyptian security, the SSI, summoned Rami for interrogation in June 2008. Christine's father was a Christian activist, and they wanted to punish the family. Basically, some of it cigarettes, and uh, some of it is a special machine, very hot metal, and they just burn the back with it. 32 times. If you've got it, watch it. If you don't, call your TV provider to get HDNet today. Welcome back to the Middle East Report. We can see in that clip uh, some of the horrendous conditions and particularly the use of torture against uh, Christians that have been occurring in Egypt and that happened uh, under President uh, Mubarak and uh, worse things are happening now under President Morsi for the Christian community. Um, Stuart, I really want to bring you on to the next subject um, and it's something that you're doing a lot of work on and that is the plight of uh, Christians living in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Mm -hmm. And we know that um, Iran is known for its very controversial nuclear weapons program and yeah. being a state sponsor of international terrorism. Um, but sadly, we don't hear enough about uh, the human rights abuses and the abuses of religious freedom within Iran. Can you tell us something about the plight of uh, Iranian Christians uh, living under the Islamic Republic of Iran? Well, there is no freedom of religion for Christians living in Iran. And uh, um, the basic problem is that ever since I had been the national director of uh, Christian Solidarity Worldwide, May 93, we have dealt very closely uh, with the persecution of Christians in Iran. The church is underground and when it's put its head above the parapets, like for instance, let's go back to 94, April 94, Bishop Haik of Sepia Mir, who was uh, chairman of the Evangelical Alliance in Iran. He asked the Rapporteur for Human Rights in Iran to come to visit Iran because one of his best friends, Mehdi Dibaj, had been in prison for eight years. Uh, he was an apostate. Um, Haik had allowed Muslim converts to Christianity to come into churches. That was against the law. And he had uh, publicized in the West the plight of Mehdi Dibaj. And very unfortunately, we campaigned with many others about Mehdi Dibaj being in prison for eight years. Um, and Haik was the focus for all that. And Mehdi was freed after a worldwide campaign, prayer and publicity campaign, and Haik went missing and was found dead some 10 days later in his car. And basically he was murdered because he had drawn the attention of the world to religious freedom issues uh, related to the church, lack of them, and also the human rights abuses. And so they have continued all the way through my time as national director, of Christian solidarity worldwide. The church in Iran, the underground church in Iran, has paid very heavily for sharing the gospel, being public in uh, evangelizing and leading Muslims to Christ. And they still continue and it's getting worse. And we've seen great um, swathes of persecution against Christians over the last three years in Iran that's going on now. Basically, evangelical Christians have to put their heads under the parapets 
and uh, they can't really be free to evangelize and practice their Christianity in Iran because there's discrimination against them. Uh, if a Muslim comes to Christ, uh, that's a convert, an apostate, then they're likely to uh, be kicked out by the family. They're likely maybe not to be able to work or get a place at university. Um, and they will become a target for uh, the secret police and so on. And many have been in prison. So it's very, very difficult. And so, of course, there's lack of democracy and freedom in Iran. We've seen that in, in past years over the, when it came up to elections, uh, the mullahs keep a very strict rule on the country. Um, its human rights abuses are some of the worst in the world. They regularly hang people for uh, um, crimes that we wouldn't, we would send to prison maybe, but not like they treat them there. And so it's a really difficult, difficult problem that we're dealing with, trying to deal with at the moment. Absolutely. Uh, uh, why is the uh, regime um, very, very scared of, uh, of Christianity? Well, because that's a question, a question we want to know. Why? It's the power of the gospel. The Bible says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. And what are they frightened of? They're frightened of changed lives. And one of the things we know, Simon, and one of the reasons why this persecution is taking place is because we know that many, many, many Muslims are coming to faith through dreams and visions. They're seeing visions of Christ and they're turning up at churches, asking the pastors for Bibles and the pastor saying, well, are you a Christian? Yes. Are you a believer? Yes. How did you hear about Jesus? Well, I saw him in a dream. And so... Um, it's happening on a huge scale. Now, um, we don't know how many Christians there are in Iran, but we know that the gospel is spreading. And we know that one of the reasons for the persecution uh, um, that's happening at the moment over the last three years is because even amongst the families of the mullahs and senior mullahs, there are secret believers. Mm. Incredible. And uh, we've got such a clip to go to now called Iranian Christian Conversion. And uh, this is a story of a woman's conversion to Christianity in Iran. و حتی مثلا از سن 4 پنج سالگی شروع کردم نماز رو یاد گرفتن و مثلا قبل از اینکه وارد مدرسه بشم سوره های قرآن رو حفظ میکردم دین هستن اینا خیلی شستیشون مغزی ما رو میکردن و اگرم یه همچین چیزی میشنیدم خوشحال میشه ولی همیشه به ما میگفتن حتی اگر یه مسیحی رو بکشیم وارد بهشت میشیم و برای همین بیشتر تلاش میکردم که قانون های مذهب رو دقیق تر انجام بدم فکر میکردم حضو اشتباه گرفتم دوباره هی میرفتم حضو میگرفتم شاید این مثلا برای یه نماز ده بار تکرار میشد که من میرفتم حضو میگرفتم و بر میگشتم و مریضی روحی هم که گرفتم افسرده وحشتناکم بودم احساس کردم که هیچ وقت به خدا نرسیدم و مامانم تو حالت مرگ بود خیلی هم وابسته بودم به مامانم و گفتم که من خودم رو میکشم اگه اجازه ندی تو خونه این کار بکنم بیرون از خونه خود کشم تو جوانی تو آینده داری مامان جان و گفتم باش اگر دوست داری با هم خود کشی کنی My brothers and sisters, I'm with you tonight. The Lord has a special message for you tonight. If you're hopeless, if you're oppressed, if you're planning to commit suicide, the Lord says stop. He has a hope and a future for you. If you're planning to kill yourself, stop and call me. 
کاری که کردم انجام میدم و اگر تو بخوای پشیمون بشی من خودم تنها این کار میکنم وقتی که رفتم توی اتاق دیدم مامانم داره دایی تو برو میکنه و خیلی عصبانی شدم به من ندیرا نه چایش میگه ای میخوام باش حرف بزنم بلا میدی ای میخوام قط کن بینم چی داره خدا فردینا ای که میخوام نلج بازی نکن نمی قط کن زه نجالت بکنه خرموز مگه کیه بلا کن کشیش خرموز کیه ولی ولی شما گفتین اگه کسی When I talked to her, she was cold. She was fighting, and she told me very proudly, "I'm going to kill myself, and your Jesus cannot do anything for me." After about an hour of argument with her, uh, and I couldn't change her mind. You said it yourself. Allah has done nothing for you. Give Jesus just one chance. You can always kill yourself next week. وقتی که این فکر اومد توی سرم گفتم این بهترین راهه که یه بار دیگه تا آخرین لحظه مرگم به الله خدمت کنم. She was thinking, okay, I pray, and next week this time Jesus had not done anything for me. I call uh, live on the air and I tell everybody, look, I tried Jesus for a week and nothing has changed, and I'm going to kill myself tonight, and I would do it on the air. و بعد از یک هفته که خود کشی می کنم حد اقلش اینه که وقتی به حضور خدا میرم میگم آخرین کارم هم برای تو انجام دادم فردو صبحش که از خواب بیدار شدم ساعت به بحث نیمه شب بود که از خواب بیدار شدم دیدم و دیدم که مامانم خیلی راحت داره تو خونه راه میره و دیگه اونطوری نیست که تعادل نداشته باشه یا دستش رو جایی بگیره گفتم ما باید سریع بریم بیمارستان و وقتی که جواب رو سریع گرفتیم دکتر گفتش که فقط میتونم بگم یه موجزه شده چون هیچ اثری از بیماری ام اس نیست چجوری میشه میشه خودتون گفتین که اینشون ترمینال بودش میمون این فقط میمون خانم یه موجزه است و به یه امام دعا کردیم شما کجا نشون دادیم خانم این شب یه یک موجزه است این یک موجزه است ما اصلا به هیچ امامی دعا نکردیم به عیسی مسیح دعا کردیم
Hello and welcome back to the uh, Middle East Report. Uh, Stuart, we saw in that clip there uh, a very moving and very powerful testimony oh, yeah. of, of how you know, two women came to know the yes. Lord in an incredible way. But there is huge persecution facing Christians, but even worse persecution for those who convert away from uh, Islamic Shiism in Iran to Christianity. Yes, and um, actually there is no law on the statute books in Iran uh, against uh, conversion to Christianity. What's happened in Iran is that one or two senior imams have said that uh, converts, apostates, should be put to death. And it's on that basis that they're sentencing some of them together with on the basis of if they were born into a Muslim family, then they're Muslims. Well, in fact, many of them have never practiced Islam. Of course, we saw in that film, some have. But um, um, the, there is no law against it, you know, but it's just uh, what's happening. And so I was just totally moved by that film. And I, it made me think about burdens and sins. You know, we used to sing a song before your time, Simon. <laughs> I remember when my burdens rolled away. I had carried them for years, night and day. Then I sought the blessed Lord. And I took him at his word. Now, praise God, all my burdens rolled away. What a great day like that lady found in that film when her sins were forgiven. Amen to Great that day. and uh, healed as well. I know the organization mm. and others have worked very hard to actually campaign for the release of uh, Pastor Youssef um, Nadakani. Nadakani. And uh, thankfully, he was released by the mm. regime last September. There have been recent uh, news reports that he's been hanged. Can you confirm what his situation no, is? No, that's not true. It is totally not true. He has not been hanged. Um, he's living uh, free at the moment in um, rushed where his church is and that was um, an error so please don't take any notice of that he's well and uh, serving god mm -hmm. excellent and uh, before the program um started uh Stuart, you were telling me about the uh, facebook campaign that you had well for Nadakani, yeah when we heard in 2012 i think it was 2011 that he'd been sentenced to death October 2000, we decided to run our first Facebook campaign ever. And so we asked, yeah, um, and that's a picture of him being released from prison. But 58,000 Christians around the world uh, said they would pray and campaign with us. And so thousands of Christians sent emails into the Iranian embassies in their countries saying, please don't execute this man of God, um, please uh, bring justice for him, release him. The result of that was that last September, when he was in the court again, they found him not guilty of the charges against him. They found him guilty of evangelizing, but he'd been in prison for three years. So he, he, they released him. And so that's a picture of him being released from prison and me meeting his wife outside the prison. And uh, so he is free now. Yes. Fantastic. And uh, I know CSW are very much involved in uh, a campaign to help the release of uh, Pastor uh, Benham Arani. Can you tell us about his situation? Pastor Benham Arani was charged in 2006 and um, with evangelizing um, and um, being the pastor of his church. And he went through appeals um, but was imprisoned. Uh, in 2011, I think it was, or 2012. And he's now in a very terrible situation. He's in a prison cell uh, about 35 metres square with 40 other inmates. He's being beaten by the prison authorities. He's been beaten and abused by the inmates in his cell. He's temporarily lame. He's lost his eyesight. And we don't know how well he is at the moment. We fear that he's on a downward slope. So we need to pray for this man of God. If you're doing nothing now, please pray for Pastor Irani, a servant of God who's serving God faithfully. I think you've got a photo of him. He's a lovely man of God, being faithful to God, currently in that prison, lying in a bed. He can't walk anymore. Um, his sight has been temporarily lost. Please pray for him and pray for justice for him. Pray for freedom for him, too, and for Farshid as well, who's been in prison there for two years. Yeah. We've got a clip to go to now, produced uh, by Christian Solidarity Worldwide, called Demand Justice for Pastor uh, Benham Arani.
Today, we want you to take action for this man. His name's Pastor Benham Irani, an Iranian church leader. He was arrested in December 2006 and is still being held in one of the most notorious prisons in Iran. He's been psychologically and physically tortured there. Among other health effects, he's faced visual impairment, serious bleeding and a blood infection. And these problems now mean his life is in real danger. He needs medical attention desperately, but he's being denied it. This year, we've already seen an amazing breakthrough with the release of Pastor Yusuf Nadakani. We mobilised people all over the world at demonstrations in London and in Brussels, and also online via our digital media platforms. People really got behind Pastor Nadakani, and we want you to do the same for Pastor Ben Emirani. He's not the only one. So as the world continues to debate about Iran, please don't forget about Pastor Benem Irani, still in prison. We need you to plead with the Iranian judiciary today. Urge them to ensure that Pastor Irani gets the medical treatment he badly needs. He may only have weeks left for us to help save his life. Go to www.csw.org.uk forward slash cry freedom to take action today. Hello and welcome back to the uh, Middle East Report. Um, Stuart, we saw on that uh, mm -hmm. a very well-produced uh, clips by yourself um, looking at the plight of uh, Pastor uh, Rani. Um, now, for our viewers who feel very passionate about the plight of uh, persecuted Christians and maybe the others who are watching that this is new to them, mm -hmm. um, how can they get involved and really stand with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, first of all, they can get information that will help them and uh, pray intelligently and act intelligently in an informed way and emails into Iranian embassies do work wonders and the more pressure we put on the Iranians the more they will take notice and so if you're watching now then please 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 pray for Pastor Irani go to your computer and, or get information from CSW go to your computer and take the action we ask by emailing uh, an Iranian embassy in your country, wherever you live. Yeah, mm. um, <clears throat> there, there is no Iranian embassy in the UK anymore, is there? Um, because That's I think true. There, there was well, an incident should... back in. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, there was. Yes, yeah, sorry. So, yeah. Uh, there is yeah. no Iranian diplomatic no. representation in, in in this country. Um, but when it comes down to this issue, something the regime doesn't like, uh, and that is media attention and media focus, mm. and uh, um, particularly as there's been very high profile campaigns. Uh, on the plight of uh, Iranian Christians, and this has um, actually triggered the regime in releasing them. Why do you think that the regime is very concerned about the, its image in the world and how it's uh, covered in the mainstream media? Well, they don't like being shown up in the, in the media and in the world and at the UN, where um, we regularly, every three years, report on countries that sign the International Civil Covenant on Political Rights, um, we review it and we point out where countries break that and we've done that in Iran last year So it shows them up as a country that does not have a democratic and human rights um, um, Free country and so they just don't like it and they they would prefer not to be shown up for this And so it's very important that we do this um, and so um, well, the more we do um, the more it hurts them <clears throat> uh, what impact does it have for the, say, Iranian Christians who um, have help from outside? They have help from organisations such as yourself as uh, Christian Solidarity Worldwide and, and know that there are Christians, say, living here in Britain that are supporting them and giving them a voice. Um, how does that make them feel that uh, countries like Britain are taking their cause and their plight seriously? Well, it gives them confidence. It also helps them to know that they're not alone, that we do care about them, you know. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12:26, when one part of the body suffers, 
we all suffer. And so it's a family issue. And so they're our family and we care about them. So it shows them that we care about them. It shows them that we're doing something for them. And it gives them confidence to do more. So three things really that help them. Yeah. And also, I mean, shouldn't we also raise awareness of other religious minorities in Iran? Of course uh, we particularly, should. for example, the Baha'i well, yeah, community. Yeah, absolutely. That, we uh, do. That yeah. suffer worse persecution than the Christians mm. um, as they are really considered um, apostates in yes. the Islamic Republic of Iran. And also the Christian, sorry, the Jewish community is also under siege in Iran as well. Absolutely. Um, and uh, it's part of our work to be a voice for voiceless Christians and others. And we do that. And many MPs in Britain have Baha'is living in their constituencies and they regularly take their cases to Parliament and to the Home Secretary. And so it's one of the great joys of being uh, uh, working in a, a Christian advocacy organisation. <clears throat> when Bernard Levin did an article on Mehdi Dibaj in The Times in two th uh, 1994, he asked me, Bernard Levin phoned me and asked me what else could he say about the persecution of Christians in Iran. And I said to him, look, Bible House in Tehran is closed, it's still closed. I said the only place that Jews could get their scriptures in Iran was in the Bible House in Tehran. And so he put that in the article that Jews didn't have access to Bibles and scriptures in Iran because they closed the Bible house down. And the British Board of Jewish Deputies gave him a commendation for saying that. So we care passionately about religious freedom for all. That's excellent. Mm. Uh, and when it comes down to political representation here in the UK, and also I think we shouldn't ignore the influence now of Europe and our mm. MEPs, how important is it that we raise these issues with our MPs and our MEPs? Absolutely vitally important. And we have an office in Brussels we have four members of staff in that office who are doing briefings, regular briefings, true briefings and accurate briefings. You know, when a country invites the EU to visit them, like Egypt, for instance, that they would probably want to take them to places they want them to see. But we, because we have an office in Brussels, can then say, well, look, before you go, we'll give you a true briefing. And perhaps we'll suggest places that you should go and visit and people you should see if it's safe uh, and sensitive to do so. So it's very important and, and, and we're doing that all the time. And our staff in Brussels are do, regularly doing briefings, uh, chairing hearings, facilitating briefings. Uh, we work in 25 countries of the world, Simon, where Christians and others are persecuted and we're regularly briefing MEPs, the Commission and the Parliament on what's going on in the world. Fantastic, which is uh, such important work and mm. such vital work as well. Um, before me, I have your book, um, Stuart Windsor, God's Adventure, and uh, we'll have uh, very shortly the cover of your book. Now, this is your autobiography. Biography, um, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I've already started reading a bit of the introduction uh, before the program, but uh, can you tell us about this book and uh, certainly the way the Lord has led you on incredible journeys and adventures. Yeah, abs um, absolutely. Well, Simon, I'll tell you one story. I, I've been for 20 years touring the churches in Britain and doing between 70 and 100 talks a year, sometimes midweek, weekends, conferences and uh, schools. And so many, many people have said over the years, well, you should write a book. And so I did write the book um, and it talks of some of the incredible Holy Spirit meeting. For instance, um, let me give you a quick one. I, when, we, when Lady Cox and I were working in Armenia uh, with Elam Ministries, we had gone there in March 93. We had gone uh, to, the, to fly to Paris where we could get an air, aircraft to Yerevan, one of the most ancient cities in the world, which is overlooked by Mount Ararat. And we were standing in a queue of 200 people waiting to get on the aircraft myself and my sound recorders, who was from an Elam church in Manchester, and we were right at the back of the queue, and we saw two ladies coming down the queue, and they were saying this. God has showed us in a dream, there are two Christians on this aircraft. We have some materials to take to a young pastor in Yerevan. Are you those Christians? Amazing. Well, as they came to us, I said to my friend, I think we'll have some fun. So when we, they got to us at the back of the queue, they said, look, God has spoken to us in a dream. We've come all the way from London. We've got some Bible materials, some Bibles, some tracts, and some devotional material to give to a young pastor in Yerevan. Are you those? 
And so I, I said loudly so everybody could hear, do you mean that God really spoke to you in a dream? He doesn't do that today, does he? And they looked at us and they said, yes. I said, well, relax, you've found your Christians. I knew the pastor anyway, so he'd been trained at the IBTI College in Burgess Hill. And so I took, his name was Ashot, and I took the materials through that meeting. When we moved the office down to New Malden in Surrey, their friend who lived in um, uh, just nearby, by fleet, uh, I, I went to live with Spencer and Grace Nash for, for a year through that meeting in the airport in um, Paris. Now, that story's in the, in the book. There's more to it than that. But so there were many Holy Spirit stories that we've put in the book to encourage Christians, you that are watching, that God wants to use you. Don't be frightened. Don't be scared. If you feel that God is speaking to you to do a thing, then do it. You'll be surprised at what might happen. Fantastic. And how can our viewers get a hold well, of they can, a copy of Well, they can hit our website and they get a copy or they can get a copy from Amazon. I waived all the royalties to CSW. Uh, the book is £9 and every penny goes to CSW. And it's got some incredible Holy Spirit stories in of how God led us. That's, that's amazing. And um, what is it like when you personally go and visit some of these uh, churches that are facing persecution uh, in the third world? And what's their response to you when they see you? Well, for instance, when we were going to Sudan redeeming slaves and we were leaving Lockie Chockey Airport in Kenya and flying in a little Cessna to a strip somewhere in southern Sudan where there had been slavery and the people would come out from the village wait on this little mud strip and they'd be led by a boy or a girl carrying a cross and they would say to us thank god you've come we thought that nobody cared for us in the west hmm. do you care you who are watching do you care about the church in iran the church in syria the church in iraq please please pray uh, and please contact us and get more information uh, yes, which is very important. It's very important that particularly in this um, mm. uh, era of 24-7 uh, news and the information age in, in which it's been termed that we actually uh, uh, in update ourselves and understand really what's happening to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. So like you said, we can pray, we're more aware of what's happening mm. and we can then take the right course of action which is needed. And one thing I've been saying on a lot of these programs is that Christian need, Christians need to get politically active. Absolutely. Um, we need more Christian politicians in the town halls, the city halls and in Parliament to speak up for the truth and stand for God's truth and the word of God in our country. Please don't leave the town halls to atheists, humanists. Please get involved. Absolutely. Uh, Stuart, I just want to thank you so much for being my guest on today's thank Middle you, East sir. Report. And thank you so much for bringing the plight of the uh, persecuted church to our attention, particularly in the Middle East. Thank you, Simon, very much. God bless you all. Just want to thank you all for watching today's uh, Middle East Report, in which we've looked at the uh, persecution and the discrimination that so many Christians face across the Middle East. Our newspaper headlines are saying we could see the end of Christianity in the Middle East as we see a mass exodus of Christians. But we know in Iran that the underground church is growing, uh, that there are a number of different uh, uh, Arabs that are coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's hope. And where there's hope, that's where God is. Mm. And so we need to Amen. continue to pray and support our Christians uh, who are living in the Middle East, who are under incredible persecution. And we need to be politically active on their behalf to actually campaign for their either their release or for their freedom. And certainly what the Middle East needs is that freedom of religion and worship in what is becoming a very troubled and darkened region of the world. And we'll leave you with this song. And thank you for watching today's Middle East Report. <laughs>